All aboard for the sightseeing tour from Galway to Dublin. All aboard. Hold it, hold it. Mary Ann is coming up the street. Hold what? Put Mary Ann in the baggage car. I know. All aboard. Train, train. Hello and welcome to Off the Beaten Track. My name's Mike Mulvihill. We all have a fascination with trains, whether it's through the very young with Thomas the Tank Engine. That's our me. Oh, look at that! Or maybe someone older with a model train set in their attic or playroom. Everyone feels connected in one way or another with locomotives, just like the way trains connect us all, with travel from one end of the country to the other. And in some cases, like the Eurostar, from one country to another, for example, like England and France. I remember my first time on a train, the clickety-clack as the train moved along the track and also getting to go to the local train station every so often to pick up Uncle Jack from Dublin, a man who worked on the rail and always had many stories to share when he'd visit. When I was about 10 or 11, a steam engine one Saturday was scheduled to stop at Carrick and Shannon train station as part of a tour it was doing around the country at that time, on the main line, a system also known as the broad gauge, and I was there to see it all. It was a one-off, I heard people saying. It'll probably never make this journey again, others said. But on Sunday, March 13th, 2016, the old steam engine rolled down the tracks again from Dublin to Carrick and Shannon, and later that day for a special trip from Carrick to Boyle, then the return trip to Carrick before making its journey back to Dublin. I got the chance to travel on the return route called The Boil. It was a fantastic experience with a huge crowd turning up for the event on the platform for a chance to see this piece of history or travel on it. It was a real trip down memory lane. The first person I spoke to in Carrick and Shannon while waiting for the steam engine to arrive was Jim Gillooly, who travelled 25 miles to be there on the day. He said to me that he'd love to see more days where the steam engine would be making an appearance on the tracks. Yeah, definitely would, yeah. Like the steam engines and bit of vintage stuff in general. I'm in a vintage club myself and a few bits and pieces and... Um, with the uptake that's on this run today it nearly speaks for itself that, you know, the, the tickets were sold out uh, early on. Rang during the week looking for tickets and they were all gone. The Cavan Leitrim narrow gauge rail system, which operated from 1887 to 1959, was a light railway which ran from Belturbet in County Cavan to Drummond in County Leitrim a combined 34 miles, and a tramway which serviced Ballinamore to Drumshambo and later in 1920 to the coal mines of Arigna in County Roscommon, which worked out at 15 miles. It's hard to believe nowadays, especially when we look around and see so many cars, that when this railway was running, it's what people used as a form of transport to get around, and something everyone depended on. This programme will look at what the narrow gauge railway brought to the community of Drumshambo and surrounding areas and the effects it had on the local economy, either by importing or exporting goods or passengers along its route. Our journey first takes us to Drumshambo in County Leitrim to see part of an exhibition which opened to the public in June 2013 called Glimpses of the Past, which is located over the Credit Union offices in Drumshambo. It has on display a number of photographs of the narrow gauge in operation. Noel McPartland, proprietor, takes us on from there. Good morning, Mike. Nice to have you here. Thanks very much, Noel, and it's great to be here. We were taking a look at the visitor's book here and there's names in this book from Australia, from all around Europe, from America. 
and New Zealand and lots of visitors over the years, Noel, to this museum. Yeah, quite a few. Now. We actually opened down the street in a smaller place in 2013, the year of the gathering. And I decided to give all of the contents of this place that I have, plus more in the house, to the community. And I approached the credit union and they very kindly agreed to make the home up here for it. So this has all belonged to the community. We moved up here, we have much more room, we have a lot more stuff, and since Joe Duffy did the relaunch for us back in July, uh, we've got a lot more stuff in, because people who were here that night said, well, we have a lot of stuff at home, we should bring in some of it. It's for the future. I think every little town should have a place like this, you know. It's a home for all of the stuff having to do with the industry, the railway, the industry being very much... Uh, part of Laird's various companies, which is now the Food Hub, of course. We have a, a couple of uh, genealogy books here from the various churches for baptisms and all the rest and deaths and burials, particularly the Church of Ireland and the Methodist Church. They're great records, and I'm getting some in now from the, the local Roman Catholic Church to uh, help people when they do come to trace their relations. The time period that we're talking about, it went through a lot of historical moments, 1916, world wars, the electrification of Drumshambo. That's right. Just on the electrification side, we had the electricity here from 1905 to 1955 due to the good offices of, of Caleb Laird, who was the founder of C.S. Laird Limited. And he supplied electricity to the town from 1905 until rural electrification came in in 1955. And I can remember the electric light so well because I only lived four doors up the street from it. And you'd hear this hum from the time the light would come on during the evening, in the winter time, and it would go off about midnight, and then you could go back to sleep. <laughs> Just an amazing memory from that, you know. Initially, he started it out to power his own enterprises. He had the mill and he had several other things, but he came up with this idea of supplying the town and he got a, a man from Wicklow, Jack Kane. And Jack came up here about 1903 and he was the man that set up the whole thing. The narrow gauge rail system would have been very important for oh, very much so. getting goods in and out of the town and uh, stock. Caleb Laird was a great supporter of the railway and in fact I'll show you a picture later on of him sitting in the last train engine heading out of town in 1959 but he was a great supporter of it because there were flour millers as well there were agents for Ranks Flour and all of the consignment came by rail and uh, it might come to Drummond and on then to Balnamore and down here. It's fantastic so it is and there's so many photographs in glimpses of the past here in Drumshambo. We're going to move across to maybe some of the narrow gauge photos that you have Noel on display here and I suppose one photograph that's looking down on us is a photograph of a car accident and one of the engines. That's correct. That was, that was taken actually in 1953 and was taken by a photographer who was on the train that day. He was over with a bunch of uh, railway enthusiasts from the UK and they were on the train and were here for the full week. But on the way out to Rigna, the train collided with a, a car that got stuck on the line just out at, at about a mile from town here. The train saw the car, but couldn't stop. It was only going about eight or nine miles an hour. So it tilted it over on its side. The two passengers, two brothers from Arigna, got out and apart from being shaken, they were not hurt at all. And eventually they got the car cleared and the line was reopened. There was no closing for a week or 10 days or no, no forensic experts coming in to see what happened. But those men who were there now, they're all in their tweed suits. And they were real railway enthusiasts, and their main interest was the engines. And that particular engine there now is the Lady Edith, which is still around and in uh, Monmouth in New Jersey, in a museum there. And the late Joe Mooney, who was a great supporter of the railway, he went and visited with his wife Eva, God rest her, uh, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. And I have some pictures, they're in a, an, an album over there, taken of him on the train in the... New Jersey warehouse. But that particular train there is, is, is it's, it's an iconic picture, really. And we were kids, home from school, and the word came into town the train had crashed into a car. So we cycled out to 
the scene. We couldn't get that close to it. We were up over at the track. But I remember all the crowds there, and we were trying to see it, but we were shifted and sent home. But nobody was killed, and it, it is a marvellous picture. It's fantastic. And one thing to note about all the photographs on display here, we're not talking about photographs as such. We're talking about photographs which have been blown up to poster size. That's right. Yeah, I got that done in 2009. We were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the closing of the railway. All those pictures were blown up and done for me by Sign Warehouse, Cormac Rogers. He did those in 2009. And they really are very, very effective. And people come in and say, gee, that's a fantastic picture. Now, if it was much smaller, you wouldn't just see the detail of it, but it's, it's marvellous. That picture there, for instance, now, always reminds me of some, maybe something out in, 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 in the American Midwest or something, or out in the far west. It's a train crossing from Roscommon into Leitrim at the Galley Bridge. And there were two bridges there. There's the road bridge there, and then in the inner side was the railway bridge. And that's a train now coming back from Rigna and coming into Drumshambo. And we notice here the number three on this engine. There was eight in total, is that right? That's right. And that number three actually denotes, that's again, is that famous Lady Edith. Now, I haven't got the list of names here, but they're all named after the director's wives or daughters. Lady Edith being one, one of the prime examples of that. Because I remember every yard of that line. And the train leaves Ballinamore, comes to Ballyduff, comes on to Carnabrone, Crea, into Trimshambo, and on to Arigna. And people would come back on the train from Arigna to do their shopping, and the train would have seven or eight carriages of coal. So it was... That particular picture there now is actually passing the entrance to the Loch Allen Hotel. That gives you an idea where it is. So th- this would be down opposite the the Mayflower. Absolutely, opposite the Mayflower. That picture was taken, I think, in 59, yeah, five days before it closed. The Mayflower opened in 1960. So there was big changes. And you know, it's great, you've got names to go with some of these people in the photos. Eamon Daly Daly now did a lot of this work for me for, for the 50th anniversary. And right now we'll play part of a song sung by Eamon Daly with harp playing by Orla Daly called The Narrow Gauge. When going to Trombot There are still some That prefer to sit behind Dooner's Grey Going to Beltorbet They surely curb it The brakes are on all the blessed way F2 drum shambo, you by the tram go, no slower passage can you engage. Jack Redsey's donkey, they call him Spunky, would beat King Edward on the narrow gauge. The Irish royal might shout disloyal, so hear my meaning I should define. King Ned's an engine was mad dad bingin, fair lovely bingin on the Rhine. So Sergeant Brian, a cute and sly one, may seek promotion by some other stage. Else him I sentence to due repentance and twenty miles on the narrow gauge. Was my intention much more to mention Though half its praises I haven't sung Big baby's bawling and Molly's calling With click, 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 telegraphic tongue But sweet as the thrushes on trees and bushes Or pet canary in gilded cage when I have leisure, I'll sing with pleasure the countless beauties of the narrow gauge. That's an interesting shot there of the train about to pass, which was then Kiltrubbert Post Office, owned by Doyles. And the thatched roof of that was burned many times and sparks from the train, so eventually they put a slated roof on it. Now that's a train coming into Drumshambo. That was the weekend that the train closed. And you can see this man here with his Easter lily. 
So there must have been some kind of a Republican commemoration in town that day as well. Was there one of the engines called a... a there politi- was. Uh, well, what's this that one was now? Yeah, I have something on that here. And that was a... <laughs> that was done as a, as a exump to the owners and the directors because it was purely... Dominated. So it would have been a, a controversial engine. It would have been, oh, very much so, yeah, very much so. Freddie Easterbrook used the narrow gauge around the Kiltubbert section of the line. He has fond memories of when the narrow gauge operated. That's right, yeah. Uh, just down run down the road from the house across the road, you used to reach it there and I'd be down to see it. I'd go into a fair and you had to get off the road behind it. <laughs> and now I was on it a good many times now. I was on the last voyage. Just stop nearly anywhere, <laughs> yeah. Several trains a day of coal going on to go to Drummond. And then I used to ca- draw the cattle from the fair. Would would there be trailers on carriages that would bring the cattle for the fairs? Yeah, there was cattle trailers on it. it would, and the, trail, the cattle would go from the shop up to Drummond. When the farmers up the country get the cattle brought up on the train before the lorries started. Well, the driver was a neighbour of mine, so it was all local. <laughs> And we're waiting here a good while today, so we are, yeah. for the train. Would this be normal for a steam engine? Oh, it would. I had an uncle at home from England now. He was English, married to my mother's sister. And we were waiting for the train one day and it didn't come. And he asked the woman at the station house at the suburb, when is this, the two o'clock train coming? She says, it's usually here about 25 past two. Well, he's holding all up. <laughs> this was a different story coming from England. Oh, no, he couldn't believe it. I said, the wife knew well what was this, and she used to make a fool of him about it. <laughs> and would it travel fast now when it would be on know, the tracks? No, you could find any in a bicycle. Is your cycling hard on a bicycle? Probably hold on to it. Ah, you could, but you mightn't be safe. <laughs> It was a big loss for the town when it went and for the area. It was a big loss for the area, yeah. All the w- women would go in on it shopping, you know, and it was um, love to see it coming, puffing up. It was... Is it something that you'd like to see coming back? And do you think, is there ever a chance that it will come back? Uh, not today, or I don't think any, because the rails is all gone and the ro- it was along the road and it's all waiting. But I'm trying to do it, I think, a bit of throwing it down to Van Hoor and it. To be nice, it could go down there because it's not along the road. The benefits, Noel, of when the system was in operation and then when it closed. It was a huge loss. My sisters all went to school in, 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 in the St. Louis Convent in Monaghan. And they used to go back to school in September. And they'd get the train here to Ballinamore onto Bell Turbot. And then they took a bus from there into Monaghan, to save my father going up, you know. Uh, I rode the train a few times, not that often. I rode to Torigna many times, but never up that much to Bellamore, I think about twice. But, you know, if it was there now, you'd, you'd, you'd nearly live on it, because <laughs> it's a great memory. Very funny picture here. This man is coming into town. He was a man called Jordan, and he was coming into town with his donkey and cart and his wife on board and his dog in front. And he stops the train, which wasn't unusual because he was expecting a parcel. How are you, Parky? It's a lovely day. What can we do for you? Ah, it is a beautiful day out there, Jimmy. It's great. Do you have a pack for me there, Jimmy? Or, or hang on a second, I'll just get one of the lads to have a look. That'd be great, thanks. All right, Jimmy, you're an awful man to be stopping the train like that. All right, Packy, uh, they're pointing up at me and there doesn't seem to be anything here today. But but try try us again tomorrow. There might be something tomorrow. And in the next shot, he's over here talking to the guardsman. I, I believe he didn't get the parcel, but the man holding the donkey and cart is the driver of the train. Oh. <laughs> and in the, in the other picture I had there, there was a picture of the driver of the train actually up in the donkey and cart. But that was the informality of the whole thing, you know? So people might be stopping for a chat along the way. Oh, yeah. That was very, it was very informal, really. At that time, this train would have brought in 
and out livestock as well. Oh yes, and and, and on, on big occasions such as the Porty Uncle indulgences in the church on the 1st and 2nd of August, there were special trains put on to bring the pilgrims into Drumshambo. And The older people would tell you all about that. And I remember I'd be serving Mass up there in the 40s and the place was thronged. You might see these few pictures I have here from the convent. Uh, the convent opened in 1864, and when they came here first, while the convent was being built, the, the owner of this house, um, McCones, the nuns operated from there for a short period, and then they moved to the new premises up there. Now, in my time as a mass server in that convent in the 40s, you had at least 45 nuns there. Today, there are only four, and they're getting a few more in from the Philippines, but huge change. And the convent that we're talking about is the Poor Clear Sisters? Poor Clear Nuns, yeah, the Poor Clear Sisters, and they've been a huge asset of this area all those years, and uh, still very busy. And an enclosed order, they, they don't go out? No, they don't go out, no, no, they don't go It's enclosed, and they get a lot of callers. And it's amazing how people, when there's problems in families, sickness and all that, they all flock to the nuns. Now, I have a lot of relations in Dublin, and if anything goes wrong anywhere, they may not be going to Mass every Sunday, but they'll always ring up and say, whichever gets so-and-so prayed for in, in, with the nuns. We hear now from Eugene Redahan about why the narrow gauge was so important to the local community. And in the background, you can hear the steam engine heading off out of town on its journey back to Dublin. And beside me is Eugene Redahan. And Eugene has fond memories of the narrow gauge visiting Drumshambo. We're talking about, I lived in Longford, we lived in Longford and I had an aunt in Drumshambo. And it was about a twice yearly visit. We went down there to visit her. Visit her was one of the highlights, but the biggest highlight was waiting for the train to come in on the narrow gauge into Drumshambo. Many, many years we, we, we went on that trip and uh, it was always such fun. As One of my greatest memories on the steam uh, train system was the narrow gauge coming into Drumshambo was an integral part. In fact, I remember when it shut down and it was uh, a very, very sad occasion. In fact, there are some beautiful pictures around the town of Drumshambo uh, to uh, keep the memory of that old line still there. Brendan Wisely from Ballinamore spoke to me about his father, Michael Wisely, who worked as a guard on the narrow gauge between Belturbic County Cavan and Drummond County Leitrim. He joined the railway in 1912, and uh, he, he, that's when he joined the railway force, and he retired in 1956. That's when he retired, 1956. So when you say that he was a guard on the railway, what would he have done? He was in charge of the, of, the, of the train, like, you know, the, the driver and fireman, they, they were the engine. He was in charge of the train, collecting the tickets and, you know, and uh, when he wanted to stop, and the, and the next day, the small stop, like, you know, like a lot of daily, not to that hell of that, that he'd have to stop there, like, you know. That. If the train ever broke down or anything like that, there was a procedure that they did. You had to go back a mile or half a mile and they'd lay down a fog signal every on the yard or every on the yard. That the train coming out to relieve them to bring it back in the, into the station, they'd know that he was getting near. There. It could be dark at night, there were no lights that time, and it, then when he had the fogs in, then the other train coming would know that it was near the other the breakdown train. So that would take, take him into Ballinamore or something like that, you know. And you yourself would have been on the trains and, and operating between Belturbet and Drummond a lot? Yeah, the, when we get me holidays, I was on the train regularly, like, you know. 
and uh, it was helping me farther out on, on the train, like you know, throwing out leaflets at the at the halls, like then when, when the uh, it would become a monthly uh, a monthly uh, timetable, and they know when the, when the extra train going on like a fair day, and they know when they were coming, and uh, the whole hall keeper opened the gate, they know that the train extra trains on, like you know. So a lot of people would have used this line when it was in operation. How many would you think, like, every day would, would be using it? Oh, there a lot of people. But that day, no, nobody had cars, like, you know, and they really wanted to go to the fair or any of that, you know. The, the, they brought cattle as well, like, you know, the, the big fair in Mohol, like, that was the Monday Fair, 28th of February, 25th of February, and that was a big day. They used to bring the, the cattle from Mohol Fair down to Belturbet and transfer the, the cattle then from Belturbet onto the broad gauge and then go off the Belfast or wherever it was, like, you know. Uh, we were we, we had the narrow gauge, but the bell turbot from there on they thrown us on the Belfast. They were the broad, what they call the broad gauge, the same in Drummond. The Sligo drum, the Sligo Dublin train was what they call the broad gauge, and we were known as the narrow gauge. So that's what we'd be on at the moment, the broad gauge. Broad gauge, that's right, broad gauge. That's what that was the term the the railwaymen used that time, the broad gauge. And a lovely chime. You could probably hear it in the background of the sound of the engine and uh, the whistle a few minutes ago. That's right, yeah. And, and, and you hear when you open the window there, you hear that. Or, or you know when you were labouring or when you were getting when you're getting over the bank and then you go freewheeling then, like, you know. And finally, just going back on the narrow gauge, is it something that you'd like to see coming back to you? think that there'll ever be a time when the narrow gauge will operate again between Drummond and Belturbet? Will it ever happen? It's too late now. It's, it's gone. It's gone. It's so many years they're closed now. In the beginning, they could have got it, like you know. But no, no, never we will be. Never, never, never. We would go down as kids, and we used to play at the station on the Sunday because there were no trains running, and we would put the bogey on the line. We could four or five young lads could lift the frame and put it onto the four wheels, and we push it up the hill towards Ballinamore. And we get on and come, what we thought was doing 100 miles an hour back into the station. But we were caught once by Tom Joe Shandley, the, the, the uh, goods store man. And he <laughs> we never went back there again. But they also had fog signals. And he put them on the line that day when he saw us up the line. And when we came down, within, within maybe 100 yards of the station, we hit the first fog signal. Boom! Two of the lads jumped off. We could have been killed. But eventually my brother, my twin brother, Sean, he stayed on and said to Tom Joe when he got in, he said, I'm after, I took this off the lads up the line, he said. And I, I can't repeat what Tom said, but we never went back to that again. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so many stories about that. We used to go down to the store to see if any stuff had come off the train for the shop. And we used to go in and annoy poor old Tom Joe Shandy. And, he st- and did the cigarettes come from players for the shop? No, they didn't come. And then... When we insist, are you sure? We'd be run out of the place. We had the poor man annoyed. But it was our playground. And one small story I'm going to tell you. The fair days here were very big. And the train was a big part of that because the northern buyers came in, they bought their cattle, and the cattle were loaded on the train, brought on to Belturbet and on to the northern line. And uh, we had one cow. And we found out a small bit of land down where the hotel is now. And we were down at the station one day, a fair day, and they were loading cattle onto the train. And we spotted our cow. We were only about nine or ten at the time, being loaded onto the train. And we tried to stop it. Sure, we were ran out of the place. And we went back up bawling, crying to my father. And we said, our cow has gone on the train. I forgot to tell you, he said, we sold the cow. <laughs> And by the way, just on another subject, we're talking about Brexit and the hard border. That was the hard border at Black Line in 1966, and that's my father having his documentation checked as he crosses the border from Black Line into Belcou, going to Enniskillen. And somebody, some of his passengers took that, he had a hackney business, took that particular picture, and uh, I hope we don't see a return of that. So this day he, he would have been driving uh, a motor car at that time? Oh yeah, he'd been driving and probably had a passenger going to Enniskillen or maybe going to Belfast. But it's Sherbrooke Park and that black line border crossing in 1966. 
Yeah, and we don't know what's in store with Brexit. Well, we you know, it's still, still being talked it. about and it's uh, one of those iconic photographs yeah, that are here, uh, one of many. Well, this was what I referred to earlier. Caleb Laird was given the honour of supposedly driving the train from Drumshambo as it left for the last time out as far as Kiltubbert. And they gave Caleb the honour. Now, at that stage, Caleb was uh, 80 years of age. And we notice here he's pulling the whistle, it says here. So that would have been a well-known sound around these oh, parts that, back then. I mean, I, that, I, the people used to come in to town shopping and then they'd take the train back, say, out to Arigna. And when the, the train was in no great rush now, they'd be at the station for a good while. And then all of the supplies for the shops in the town. My mother had a small shop down in Church Street where we were all reared. Most of our supplies came on the narrow gauge, like Jacob's Biscuits and all of the rest, which unfortunately are no longer made in Ireland, they're made in the UK. But before they left, about five minutes before they were leaving, they gave three blasts on the whistle, and people who were shopping could hear that, and they rushed back for the train, because somebody might come in and say, did the train whistle for a rigna yet? And I remember that very well, them coming into our shop, and they'd ask my mother, did the train whistle for a rigna yet? They didn't want to miss their lift home, you know? And just with the photograph next to this... That's actually the turntable. When the train went out there, it drove onto the turntable, the engine did, and it was manually pushed around and headed back for Drumshambo. No, you wouldn't get many CIE people to do that today or Irish Rail. <laughs> yeah, so the train would have drove on to a rotating plate. That's correct. And manually. the plate then would have been pushed manually right. by right. local men, right. uh, probably working in the mines. Well, no, the pillars that were there now are all CIE people. That was the last day of the train. This next photograph is all of the children from the schools around the area who come in with her teachers to see the last train leaving. And it was a very emotional time, you know, for people that were so used to it. And, and uh, I remember my dad telling me, I was actually away that time. I had gone to America the year before. And uh, I remember Joe Mooney wrote to me and sent me a lovely recording of the um, last train leaving. And I was living in an apartment in the Bronx in New York, and I remember it was very emotional now that this, this train was never going to be there again. You see, when CIE took the decision to close the railway in January 1959, and within six weeks of it closing, everything was lifted. And even that engine I spoke about that went to the museum in New Jersey, that the railway closed in March 59, and that engine arrived in New York in, in July 59. So there was really no going back. Now, to try and resurrect that today, even on a small section of it, you have all the, the permanent way, as we call it, that's all owned by different people, you know? And if that was to happen at all, it should have happened in the 60s. And the big pity, Joe Mooney did his very best in those days to try and keep a portion of the line open, even from Drumshambo to Origna. And if that had to happen, but it, of course it didn't, you'd have a huge asset there today bringing people out to the Rigna Mining Museum, which is a huge success. You know, the only man that has tried to keep the railroad going is Michael Kennedy up in Drummond. And he's doing his best up there, against the odds, really. But he has, at least he's kept it going, and he has the old engines there, and he has a lot of paraphernalia from the old railway. And we're here in Drummond, and we're with Michael Kennedy, and lovely to be here, Michael. Uh, thank you very much. And this is our living part of the Cavan Leitrim Railway. We actually, things actually move around here. And uh, we've got half a mile of railway line at Drummond, out to Cuncollery, where we run our trains. Railway was built in 1887, and it lasted until 1959, and everything was taken away. And I came here in 1992 with 40 lorry loads of railway equipment from Water and Tipperary and set about putting all this back with a few friends. And if I hadn't come here in 1992, there'd be houses and apartments out there where the railway is today. And we can see the lads out here working today. They're putting down Sleep. new sleepers and yeah. laying down the line again. Yeah, that's, that's an ongoing thing all the time. You've got to keep renewing the place. And uh, things get worn out. And... Uh, we take the rails up and we put in new sleepers and we, we put in spikes called dog spikes. We hammer them into the sleepers to hold the track in place. 
We've had a look around what Michael has here. Some amazing stuff. Yeah, we, we collect all kinds of things. Aeroplanes, buses, trains, trucks, fire engines, guns. And the guns, some of the guns we have are very, very rare. And we're looking at a, a French gun from 1917. And uh, it was fired in the First World War by the French. Captured by the Germans, recaptured by the British and sold to the Irish Army. And it was last fired in the Glen of Amal in the 1950s by Mullingar Barracks. And a bit flew off one of the guns. They fired them in as a battery, four or five guns together, and hit a fellow on his head. But he was wearing a helmet. So the helmet was damaged. And the helmet is still on display down in Athlone Barracks. It was in Mullingar. The museum has now moved to Athlone. But the helmet that was damaged during the firing of these guns is still in, in existence. But your man didn't get injured. His helmet did. When we turn around from this, there is an engine here which you're Bordenamona. restoring at the moment. It's from Bordenamona and it's a, a Ruston engine with a Gardner engine inside it. And these were all restored by Bordenamona from the originals in the 1970s. And by the 2000s, they were out of use. And I went down to Bordenamona and acquired a lot of them. And we brought them home. And by one by one, we're doing them up. Now, we'll make our way outside and... It's amazing, as Michael did say, you never know what you'd see here. There's aeroplanes, there's fire brigades, uh, there's... Bicycles. Bicycles. And the bicycles are for the railway, not for the road. And uh, our own bicycle here is a three-foot gauge bicycle, built last year for a programme we had here on the line with Michael Portillo called The Great British Train Journeys of the World. And uh, if you look on YouTube, you'll see me cycling the bike with Michael Portillo down the line. This bus here is actually a cabin bus, and it's a 1947 cabin. We found it behind a house in Mughal, this one here, the blue and cream one. And uh, it was behind Canon Meisner's house in Mughal, and he was a rector there. He's long dead. And uh, we bought it and brought it to, to Drummond. And uh, it used to run between Longford and Cavan every Saturday in the 60s. It's a Leyland Tiger from 1947. All the uh, Leyland buses are named after cats. That was one thing about the engines, Michael, for the narrow gauge. They all had a different. Names. Yeah, they all yeah. had different names. There was eight engines, and um, they were all named after the daughters of the directors, except two other engines that were called Queen Victoria and King Edward. And King Edward was a big, big engine, sat in Ballinamore, and never went anywhere. Queen Victoria was one of the smaller Stevenson locomotives, and the men didn't like driving an engine called Queen Victoria when it came to the War of Independence. So they took the name plates off and they put them under a wood stack in Ballinamore. And the management in turn found the nameplates and put them back on again. So the lads drove the engine out to Drumshambo where the line went and took the nameplates off for the second time and put them down a deep well where they're still supposed to be there to this day and painted the engine green, white and orange and called it the Sinn Féin engine. And that was only one of the stories. And earlier on in the programme we heard from Noel McPartland who was talking about an engine that ended up going to New Jersey. Yeah, and that's the uh, Lady Edith. And uh, it's not being used anymore. And a friend of mine down in Clare called Jackie Whelan has bought the engine and hopes to bring it back soon to, to Ireland after being about 50 years in the States. And there's only one other engine that exists of the Cabin Leitrim Railway, and that's in Belfast, and it's in the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, and that's Kathleen. And Kathleen is another little 440 Stevenson locomotive, an original Cabin and Leitrim engine. And then there's another engine exists, and it's a, a Tralee and Dingle engine that came here, number five, and it's back down in Tralee, but it's not going, it's, it's out of service again. I have two steam engines here, two big steam engines. I have Drummond, which is in, in the engine shed, and is out of use at the minute because the boiler search is out. And I have another one away in England at the minute called Nancy. And I have over 125,000 sterling spent in Nancy to date, with another 50,000 to go to finish it. So we hope to have it back here next year and uh, we're raising money at the minute for it and we have a little website on Facebook and all Avonside Nancy Restoration Group Fund and if you look that up you'll see everything about Nancy One question that we put to a lot of the people who we spoke to for this programme was could they ever see something happening again with the narrow gauge? Well, could you? Well, we're trying, and but it's very hard. And uh, I have been at it for years and years trying to be, get people interested. But you never know. It's a $100 million question, but someday we might get to Mohol. The station house and all is sitting there waiting for the day we can get back. And the line is five and a quarter miles to, to Mohol station from here. And it would have made an ideal line. It would have thousands of people to attract them to Leitrim as, as holiday makers to travel on the, on the railway. And that would bring more business to the likes of Mohol. 
You were saying earlier on some of these buses and aeroplanes, aeroplanes, yeah, have have been in films. And yeah, you tell well, us a little bit more many, about that. I've been in many films over the years with the buses, and uh, we've got a great northern GNR Gardner up here, and that was built in Dundalk in 1951, and worked in uh, when the GNR and then went to CIE, and a friend of mine got in that loan, and when he died, I got the bus. And the bus has been in many films. It's been in Dancing at Lunas, it's been in Durango Kid, it's been in The Playboys and the Mammy. And the last big film it was in was Song for Reggie Boy. It was driving Aidan Quinn all around West Cork in it. It's um, one of only four buses of that type left in the world. Now as we make our way up here towards... The engine shed. And the engine shed is original. And when I came here to Drummond in 1992, the water tower and engine shed, you couldn't get into them. They were completely covered in ivy and bushes, completely enveloped. So we took the ivy off, killed it and brought, pulled it off the shed. And uh, we took the roof off and put it back on again. And uh, in 1900, one of the original steam engines was sitting outside the shed. And the porter got up on the, on the engine and he opened the regulator. And the engine took off and went out through the back wall of the shed. And you can see where they put the bars across to hold the shed together. And they built a big buttress here, like a church, on the side of the shed to hold the shed up. So this is the only engine shed of the Cabin Leitrim Railway. It's still doing the job it was built for today. And it's a, it's a lovely shed and there's an engine inside, a lovely engine called Drummond. Yeah, Drummond is a no-fork two-car Stewart built in 1916 in uh, Stoke-on-Trent and it worked for Balfour Beatty, which is a big English concern. And then it went on to British Aluminium up in Loch Arbor in Scotland at an aluminium factory. And in 1970, it was sold for £70 scrap value. The engine ended up in Hampshire, where it was stripped of parts. And I found the base of it in Oxford in 1985 and it took me eight years and £40,000 to put it back together again. That was nearly 30 years, 40 years ago. So that's the cost of engines have, has gone up. My second engine, with a new boiler and all built for it, has cost a lot more. Someday we'll have steam back again in Drummond. It's a lovely colour too, a lovely wine red, red. colour. Yeah, and the next engine that comes will be green. The engine, the cabin litrum engines were green and the carriages were maroon. These things on the front are the cow catchers. And the cow catchers were used to push anything off the line that got in the way. Cattle, cars, ca- people, anything. And they often, on the tramway between Balnamore and Drumshambo and out to Rigna, the, the train had the right of way over the road. So, yeah, it kept the um, train from derailing. Yeah. They would push the thing out of the way. And the wild, there were a thing from the Wild West. The, the, ca- the train's going across the prairies. The buffaloes would derail the train. So they put a cow catcher on the front of the train. And it's just like the Wild West. We're just passing yeah, a signal. signal. And the signal's from uh, Rathkeel off the North Kerry. And I got, when they were not ripping up the North Kerry in the 1980s, I got out and saved as much stuff as I could. And when I moved here in 92, I brought them with me. But that one's from Rathkeel. The big one out beyond at the shed is from Newcastle West. And the one out the line is from Abbey Field, all along a line called the North Kerry, which is made into a walkway today. What about visitors, Michael? Can people come here? People listening yeah. now? Yeah, well, we open from Easter to September and we run it three days a week, Saturday, Sunday and Monday. And it's all run with volunteers. So when they come in, we show them round and they enjoy the experience of the Cabin and Leitrim Railway. Here we've got uh, carriages. carriages. made from buses. And this one here is an AEC Regal bus converted to run on rail by Bordemona. And that was a GNR bus, then a CIE bus. They took the engine out and took the wheels off and put bogies underneath. And now today we can run it as a, as a, as a carriage. And the one behind is another old carriage. from The chassis is from 1891. And it's a Trillian and Dingus chassis with two pre-war buses joined together and dropped onto a carriage chassis from 1891. And the top of it's from the two pre-war 1930s buses. And that was used on the West Clare section of CIE behind the rail cars in the 1950s. And they had a bus coach here as well on the Cabinet Leitrim, but it didn't survive. And this is my conventional coach, which is a replica of what the originals were like, with verandas on either end, like the Wild West. And uh, it's all built of steel, but the original ones were built of timber. And there's only one survives, and that's in the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum in Belfast today with, with Kathleen, the other engine. And that little shelter there is from Doreen, which is the next little halt out the line between here and Mohol. And uh, the people there were uh, extend little halt out to make the, the station bigger for their own use. And they didn't want the, the shelter anymore. And that's an original shelter built in Ballinamore, in the workshops in Ballinamore. So I lifted it up with a high ebb and brought it home and we built it here in Drummond. And you'll see another one in Mohol as well. And most of the, the stations on the Cabin Leitrim had, had a little shelter like that. 
And when you say that uh, about the stops between here and Mohol, There was Doreen and there was another one at uh, the Swiss Cottage. And that was for a Reverend Diggs. He was involved with the Cabin Leitrim Railway. And he lived in a, in a house there. He was the rector down in Mohol. And he was into beekeeping as well. He wrote books on beekeeping way over 100 years ago. And he got on there at the Swiss Cottage. But then when you went down to Balnamore, you had Fina, you had Lauderdale, you had uh, loads of little halls along the line. And uh, it took three hours to go from Drummond to, to Bell Turbot. The train stopped at every station, went off and shunted the wagons on and off and went on again. So it took three hours to go from here to, to Bell Turbot. And then you could get a train to Belfast from Bell Turbot. And likewise, where we are here in Drummond, you'd hop on the, uh, the broad, broad gauge. And head for Dublin. Yeah. The other end, you headed for Belfast. Yeah. or anywhere else in the north. When I got in here, this was a bedroom when I got the house in 1994. And uh, we took out the ceiling, there was a drop ceiling and this original ceiling was above and there was a fitted wardrobe over there and there was, there was wallpaper on the walls. But there are the original pictures there on the wall of this, what the way the place was. They're the original station masters, a Mr. Flynn and a Mr. Toomey. And uh, from that, we were able to rebuild the whole place. And the first year we had, the, we got the station, we had a film come here called Korea, a John McGahern story turned into a film called Korea. And they sold the ticket for your man to go to America. His son fought in the Korean War for the Americans. And uh, we painted it all in glass paint. And the, the film company came in and dirtied it all down and made it look old. And we left it like that. And the original fireplace and all is still there. And that's the, the, the railway clock. And some books up on the all, shelves all as well, probably. Books from all bits and pieces from railways all over Ireland. Yeah. And that makes it look look the part. Yeah. And this is our ticket office um, when, when the state and the railways open. Well, I have to say that from entering today, yeah. it's been like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory going through That's everything that you have here. Yeah. Thanks very much, Michael, for walking us and talking us through all of that. Yeah. I've really enjoyed it. So we've come to the end of our journey of Off the Beaten Track here on Shannon Side, Northern Sound. And we're joined by Joe Wren. And Joe is from Gorva, well known to listeners of the Shannon Side, Northern Sound region, the Wren family and Joe's brother, seventh son, Aidan Wren. Joe Thanks for taking part in our programme. Not at all. Uh, it's a pleasure. You have a famous song that you're going to sing us out on. Yeah, I got this song. Uh, I guess it was about, it's probably 50 years ago or more, from a man called Keelan Gaffney, who is still alive and living in Mohill. I was probably seven, six or seven years of age. It's probably 60 years ago. It was just a song we were in his house, you know, as the Kaleers did those days. And this song came up and we, I just loved the song and kept it in my mind ever since so that's basically how I have it it's just a narrow gauge and it goes something like this as I stole from my cottage one morning just wondering what I should do with barrows with bogies and shovels a few workmen appeared in my view a ganger stood up on the forefront and he quickly wrote down on a page they were counting the rails and the sleepers as they lifted the old narrow gauge from a turbot to a doom they have lifted that one faithful friend of us all to the a thirty whistle in the morning to the schoolhouse the children would call And the men at their work by the wayside Saw the smoke vanish out like a haze As your order way out from the station Going back down the old narrow gauge T'was in pain was the excuse they were making The reason for closing it down for a handful of workmen at Drummond, they weren't able to pay a week's wage. If you want an old polar sleeper, 
The conducting engineer is your man. Oh, but three pounds a dozen you'll pay him right into the palm of his hand. And the men at their work by the wayside saw the smoke vanish out like a haze as she rode her way out from the station going back down the old narrow gauge. Going back down the old narrow gauge.